Good morning, and welcome to the Analog Devices Third Quarter Fiscal Year 2023 Earnings Conference Call, which is being audio webcast via telephone and over the web. I'd like to now introduce your host for today's call, Mr. Michael Lucarelli, Vice President of Investor Relations and FP&A. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our third quarter Fiscal 23 conference call. We've been on a call today with ADI CEO and Chair Vincent Roche and ADI CFO Prashant Mahendra Raja. For anyone who missed the release, you can find it and relating financial schedules at investor.analog.com. On to the disclosures. The information we're about to discuss includes forward-looking statements, which are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, as further described in our earnings release, and other periodic reports and other materials filed with the SEC. After results could differ materially from the forward-looking information, as these statements reflect our expectations only at the date of this call. We undertake no obligation to update these statements except as required by law. Our comments today will also include non-GAAP financial measures, which exclude special items. When comparing our results to our historical performance, special items are also excluded from prior periods. Reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to their most directly comparable GAAP measures and additional information about our non-GAAP measures are included in today's earnings release. And with that, I'll turn it over to ADI CEO and Chair Vincent Roche. Vince? Thank you, Mike, and a very good morning to you all. ADI executed well in the third quarter and delivered results within our expectations despite the challenging operating environment. Revenue was nearly $3.1 billion, led by growth in our industrial and automotive markets once again. Gross margin remained strong, above 72%. Operating margin was nearly 48%, and EPS was 249 This continued profitability reflects our portfolio's resilience, as well as the innovation premium that it commands. I want to turn to the current business environment now just for a moment. As we shared last quarter, we believe we're in a period of customer inventory reconciliation, following three consecutive years of steady growth. Through our customer conversations, it's evident these accelerating inventory adjustments relate to the weakening macro backdrop and ADI's rapidly improving lead times. Importantly, we believe we shipped below end market consumption in the third quarter and expect to do so again in the fourth. This will help normalize our customers' inventory more quickly and position us to return to growth more quickly in the coming quarters. Stepping back, while near-term dynamics are turbulent, our long-term confidence remains undiminished. Over the last several decades, we have enhanced the resiliency of our global business, defined by our diversified customer and product portfolio and flexible hybrid manufacturing model. This enables us to endure softer demand periods while sustaining strategic investments to ensure that we capitalize on the upside when the business inflects. It's these characteristics and our alignment to numerous concurrent secular growth trends that give us confidence that ADI will deliver on our long-term model of 7 to 10% revenue CAGR. Now, one area underpinning this growth outlook are the applications tied to sustainable use cases, which currently represent about one-third of our total revenue. And today, I want to unpack a vital part of this, the evolving electrification ecosystem that is driving growth in our industrial and automotive markets. As the world marches to net zero, we need to eliminate 51 gigatons of global greenhouse gases emitted every year. Fossil fuels are by far the largest contributor, accounting for more than 75% of all emissions. At the same time, global energy consumption is forecasted to increase by 50% by 2050. A major and necessary energy transition is underway, and an upgraded and expanded energy grid is foundational to support a decarbonization pathway. Making the shift to renewable energy sources in both commercial and residential infrastructure, as well as electric vehicles and global transportation, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These moves also create new challenges in the generation, distribution, consumption, and smoothing of energy supply. ADI solutions are embedded across all phases of this electrification journey, from upgrading the grid infrastructure to forming and managing the vehicle battery. 
The common thread woven through all these applications is the high-performance precision signal processing, control, and power management capabilities they require, capabilities in which ADI excels. Now today, I'll bring this story to life at the application level, starting with grid infrastructure. Overall, today's electrical grid is undergoing modernization to meet current and future demands. Historically, traditional energy sources like coal, oil, and gas were centralized and distributed in one direction, from the grid to the consumer. Today, renewable energy sources like wind and solar are more distributed, necessitating a dynamic, bidirectional flow of energy. To achieve this, the grid must be able to adjust performance across the network in real time, which requires an exponential increase in monitoring and storage capabilities. And for example, our collaboration with the NL Group provides smart meters and grid digitalization solutions for distribution system operators. Here, ADI's control and sensing technologies are enabling high performance, precision monitoring, and data creation at the heart of the digital substation. And we're leveraging our mixed signal digital and algorithm technologies to enable greater intelligence at the grid's edge. Now moving to energy storage systems, which are critical to mitigate intermittency issues across the network. ADI is a leader with our technologies used in 60% of energy storage systems across residential, commercial, and grid scale networks. Leveraging our battery management system technology, or BMS, we're increasing capacity and improving energy utilization in energy storage systems, which maximizes the battery's lifetime value. These monitoring and storage challenges extend to the grid's edge as well, including EV charging stations. ADI's energy metrology, isolation and sensing technologies help enable a broader range of applications in AC and DC charging equipment. In addition to these important applications in our highly diverse industrial segment, our high-performance signal processing platforms and domain expertise are helping to electrify the automotive market. Here, our technology is a key enabler in the transition from combustion engines to cleaner electric vehicles by increasing range and lowering cost. And I'll start with BMS. As we've shared before, we're the leader in this area, with our BMS solution designed into 16 of the top 20 EV manufacturers. We're currently sampling our eighth generation solution, which utilizes software and algorithms to enable physical measurement capabilities all the way into the battery cell. These advances in edge processing change the game in how the internal battery health is managed, supporting faster charging and better range prediction. An extension of this is our wireless BMS solution, a first in the industry. It has all the benefits of our wired solution and enables a scalable battery architecture with quicker and more cost-effective production cycles. Currently, our wireless BMS is designed in at four OEMs, and we expect another large OEM to adopt it in the coming quarters. Given this momentum and the cutting-edge value proposition, we believe the wireless platform will represent a large portion of our BMS revenue by the end of the decade. And looking ahead, we're broadening our EV capabilities beyond battery management and storage to power conversion solutions. Specifically, we're developing a silicon carbide-based smart switch for bidirectional onboard charging that significantly reduces charger size and weight by over 50% thus driving down cost. Notably, this intelligent integrated switch enables the EV to transfer energy back into the network, creating a more reliable grid. And this innovation solution more than doubles our content opportunity per EV powertrain. So in summary, ADI is driven by a deep sense of purpose and a desire for our innovations to positively impact all stakeholders. We're immensely proud of the role our technologies play to improve the well-being of humanity and, indeed, the planet. And I remain very confident in our future. Our portfolio of cutting-edge technologies 
world-class talent base are aligned with an unprecedented number of attractive secular trends where the semiconductor content per dollar of capex is increasing tremendously. This presents ADI with continued profitable growth opportunities, as well as the ability to shape the future of industries. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Prashant. Thank you, Vince. Let me add my welcome to our third quarter earnings call. My comments today, with the exception of revenue, will be on an adjusted basis, which excludes special items outlined in today's press release. While demand continued to soften throughout the quarter, ADI delivered nearly 3.1 billion revenue in line with our guidance. This was driven by continued year-over-year growth for both industrial and automotive. Looking at our performance by end market, industrial, which represented 53% of revenue, finished down 7% sequentially after a tremendous stretch of 13 straight quarters of sequential growth. On a year-over-year basis, revenue increased 4%, with most applications up, led by sustainable energy, as well as aerospace and defense, which each grew double digits. Automotive, which represented 24% of revenue, was down modestly sequentially in line with our expectations. Year-over-year growth of 15% was broad-based. We saw continued outsized growth for ADI's leading battery management and in-cabin connectivity solutions, which collectively increased nearly 30% year over year. Communications, which represented 12% of revenue, decreased double digits both sequentially and year over year due to the broad-based inventory correction we flagged previously. And lastly, consumer, which represented 10% of revenue, came in stronger than expected, finishing up 15% sequentially, but down 21% year over year. We remain optimistic that our second quarter marked the bottom for this business, despite the ongoing inventory correction. And now on to the rest of the P&L. Gross margin of 72.2% remains industry leading, but declined sequentially due to lower utilization and product mix. Operating expenses of $752 million were roughly flat year over year and up sequentially. This quarter's OPEX reflects the full impact of annual merit increases. Operating margin of 47.8% contracted 230 basis points year over year, roughly in line with the gross margin decline. Non-op expenses were $57 million, and our tax rate was 11.2. All told, EPS came in at $2.49 within our guidance range. Moving to the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with over $1.1 billion of cash and a net leverage ratio of 0.8. Given the revenue pressures and our decision to hold more finished goods versus restocking the channel, inventory dollars increased, and the days of inventory moved higher to 179. As a result, channel inventory remains below our target level and slightly declined. Specifically, we strategically undershipped Asia, especially China, due to weaker demand trends. CapEx was $325 million for the quarter as we invest to enhance ADI's global resiliency and offer our customers options on where their products are sourced. 2023 should represent the high watermark for CapEx, and we expect it to decline in 2024. Importantly, our investments do not include the benefits of tax credits and grant funds that we anticipate from both the U.S. and the European CHIPS Act. Over the trailing 12 months, we've generated $3.7 billion of free cash flow, or 29% of revenue, and over the same period, we've returned nearly $5 billion to shareholders, or over 130% of free cash flow, via more than $3.3 billion in buybacks and more than $1.6 billion in dividends. Now turning to the Q4 guidance, we expect the fourth quarter revenue to be $2.7 billion, plus or minus $100 million. This outlook assumes sell-in 
to be below sell-through. At the midpoint of our outlook, we expect all markets to be down sequentially given the broad-based inventory correction. On a relative basis, auto and consumer should perform a bit better than industrial and comms. Operating margin is expected to be 44%, plus or minus 70 basis points. This margin outlook embeds planned utilization reductions and a decline in OPEX. Our tax rate is expected to be between 11 and 13%. And based on these inputs, adjusted EPS is expected to be $2 plus or minus 10 cents. As our outlook is lower than expected, let me provide some context on what we're experiencing and how we will navigate. Our revenue outlook reflects the broad-based macro softness across all end markets, all geographies, and customers both large and small. We are also strategically improving lead times to get a better view into demand and enhance customer satisfaction. Today, we're shipping over 85% of our products within 13 weeks, and this is up from 35% a year ago. As Vince mentioned, we are seeing customers accelerate inventory adjustments due to both the software environment and our lead time improvements. And as such, we're taking measures to preserve the integrity of our balance sheet, cash flow, and income statement. This includes further reducing utilization and lowering external wafer purchases with a goal to decrease inventory meaningfully in the coming quarters. And importantly, as we've outlined before, we expect gross margins will maintain a 70% level on a trailing 12-month basis. This gross margin resiliency is a testament to the flexibility of our hybrid manufacturing model and our unique swing capacity capability. In addition to the naturally lower variable comp, we're also taking steps to reduce total OPEX by roughly $50 million sequentially. So stepping back, we're not ready to call the bottom yet, but our history shows that we cycle up quickly, and when we do, we will achieve higher highs. ADI has built a very resilient business, rich with opportunities. Our diversification and exposure to numerous secular trends drives our durable earnings stream and solid free cash flow, enabling us to consistently return capital to shareholders. And to that end, over the trailing 12 months, we've returned $5 billion to shareholders, or more than 5% of our market cap. As this is my last ADI earnings call, I'd like to give a quick thank you to Vince for his mentorship and counsel over the past six years, to the ADI board, including our audit chair, Karen Galt, for their unwavering support, and most importantly, to the world-class finance staff, including young Mike here, for always reminding us of our commitments to you, the company's owners. I look forward to seeing many of you in the coming weeks as we get on the road. Mike, let's go to Q&A. Thanks, Prashant. I don't think I've been called young in some time, but I appreciate that. Now, let's get to our Q&A session. We ask, that, we ask that you limit yourself to one question in order to allow for additional participants on the call this morning. If you have a follow-up question, please requeue, and we'll take your question as time allows. With that, can we have our first question, please? Thank you. For those participating by telephone dial-in, if you have a question, please press star 1-1 on your phone to enter the queue. If your question has been answered and you wish to be removed from the queue, please press star 1-1 again. If you're listening on a speakerphone, please pick up the handset when asking your question. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Tor Spanberg with Stiefel. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question for, for Vince. Um, so um, I know you're not ready to call the bottom, uh, but some industry observers would say that this sort of inventory build started maybe late 2021, early 2022. Based on your guidance uh, for the October quarter, you're sort of back to that level. Um, so Vince, you know, you've, you've seen these cycles. You've seen many of them. They're all different. But just wanted to get a sense for you what you think we're getting, you know, getting close, especially given what I just said about that inventory adjustment now sort of being complete. Yeah, thanks, Tori. Um, you know, when I look at this current cycle, you know, the 
The symptoms are always the same in these cycles, but the causes tend to have different components. And I think right now there are two kind of inputs to this particular correction. I think one is the inventory indigestion that exists out there that has been building for, you know, 18, 24 months now. And the second, of course, is the macroeconomic situation, which, which is a major governor as well. Uh, but I think if you look at what we understand um, from the direct side of our business, for example, when we look at our largest customers' revenue growth and their forecasts, compared to our growth at these very same customers, you know, we believe that we've been shipping below end consumption in the third and will in the fourth quarter. Um, so I think one way to look at this is how long will the inventory correction take? My sense is it will be two to three quarters before we get through the inventory digestion cycle. And I think we're positioned as a company to get beyond it quite fast because we've been managing our factories very carefully, managing our inventories both on our own balance sheets as well as our distribution channel. Um, so, you know, we've also, I think, taken a, a long-term view to the demand patterns of our customers. We haven't in any way forced them into, for example, long-term supply agreements. Uh, you know, essentially at this point in the cycle, that would be forcing them to take products that they don't really need. Um, we've been managing our channel aggressively. So uh, as I said, we're keeping more inventory in our own balance sheet. So again, we will get to distribute the supply ultimately uh, where we think it's needed when the recovery uh, gets underway here. So that's my sense, Tori. I mean, in the industry, if you look back to the dot-com cycle, you look at the 2008 financial crisis cycle, uh, most of the downturns have tended to last two to four quarters. Um, so my sense is over the next two, three quarters, we begin to see a recovery here, at least on the inventory side. And then it's really a question of how does the macro economy perform? Great perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Your line is open. Thanks, and uh, best wishes again uh, to Prashant on his next adventure. Um, you know, you said that you're not ready to call the bottom yet, and Vince, you mentioned that uh, the inventory digestion period could last uh, for some more time. How should we think about uh, Q1 seasonality? You know, it, it tends to be down kind of mid-single digit. Do you think we should be prepared for something different than that? Um, right, and if it is, um, you know, worse than kind of mid-single digit, do you still think that ADI can uh, maintain gross margins above seventy uh, percent? So just kind of puts and takes to help us uh, align our models would be very useful. Yeah, sure. why, don't, why don't I take that uh, back? So first, some quick comments just to make sure everyone has the Q4 guide correct. So on the channel, uh, as I said in the prepared remarks, we are shipping in below. Um, the forecast we have from our channel partners, so we're intentionally bringing channel inventories down to help set us up for, uh, for some better strength. Uh, the included in the guide is uh, the backlog coverage has some turns, but less than normal, given the higher level of uncertainty. Um, so we, we would need some more turns and positive book to bill, which Vince mentioned is likely to be uh, a quarter or two out. And then just from an end market standpoint, we've got all end markets down quarter over quarter. So as you know, we don't guide uh, out further than, than the current quarter, but some color is uh, I think you, you essentially have it right. There's no reason to think that first quarter would not be down seasonal, um, on a, you know, which would call it mid-single digit quarter over quarter. Uh, but that, we, our view, is going to be driven by the holidays and the customer decisions to reduce inventory as they go into the year end. So we are not, uh, we're not at this point seeing a more meaningful step down in Q1 uh, based on, on what we can know today. And I will just remember to plant in everyone as you start to model out Q1 that, um, that every once in a couple of years, we have a 14 week quarter and that will be Q1 of 24. And then on gross margins, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we're actually quite proud of our gross margin story here, um, that uh, we've, been, we've, uh, we've messaged uh, a number of times 
that um, it, it, we would have the ability to maintain a 70% gross margin in a, uh, uh, on a trailing 12-month basis with a peak to trough decline of 15%. Q4 is down uh, about 17% from the Q2 peak. And while we didn't give you a gross margin number, um, if you impute it from the OPEX uh, map that I gave you, you'll see that we're able to hold that north of 70 and, and we'll continue to, uh, to work that. For Q1 gross margins, my, my best sense now would be that um, we are likely to face a little more challenge on the utilization level as we bring inventory levels down, but we have been very successful in activating our swing capacity. Uh, we're actually doing about 10% better on utilizations because we have swing than if we hadn't activated it. So it's, a, it's been a very powerful lever for us, and, and we need to see how the math on all of that works out for Q1, but I wouldn't expect uh, Q1 to be notably different from kind of where we are for Q4. Yeah, I'd like to have one other comment with respect to what Prashanta said. So the other side of, um, of margin is pricing, and uh, pricing is very stable. It's very, very stable, resilient. Uh, I don't expect that to change. And, um, you know, our products are very, very sticky. We've got tremendous life cycles. And uh, that part of our business, this is really a unit correction in the business uh, rather than uh, than price or share. Thanks for that. Helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ambrish Srivastava with BMO. Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much. This is old Ambrish. Young Mike can feel free to chime in. Um, I, I was looking at, um, at the year over year comms. And, and I'll, I'll look at TI as your uh, closest um, peer, rival, competitor. Vince, um, they started going into a year-over-year year decline in for Q22, and you were just starting. And you said two to three quarters. So it, it, in past history, uh, that suggests that um, usually on a year-over-year -year basis, we see you know, roughly around four to five quarters of a year-over-year decline. Is that the right way to think about your business? You said two to three quarters of uh, digestion, and I'm assuming mm -hmm. that means you're over your decline in reps, right? Yeah, good question, Abrish. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, comms is just a piece of ADI's overall story. Uh, we've actually seen, I mean, we have two components as well. We've got wireline, we have wireless. I would say, um, you know, on the wireline side of things, we've seen the malaise going back into, uh, you know, the late part of 22, early part of, uh, of 23. Uh, so that's really things like optical control for data center and carrier networks and power. You know, we've got a power business there as well. So, um, you know, we think we'll see that... Uh, you know, it, that we expect to see CapEx somewhat recover in that space to be able to catch up with the needs, for example, driven by the, uh, the explosion in, in computing power that's required to handle the AI uh, inflection here, for example. So my sense is the wireline part will probably start its recovery in the first, second quarter of the year. Uh, wireless is a little harder to call. It's, it's very, very dynamic. We all know that. Uh, the developed countries, particularly in North, you know, particularly North America, uh, 5G deployments, which have really been focused on coverage rather than capacity, uh, they're going to be weaker than we thought. So that's probably going to give us headwind uh, for how long we don't know, but I think it could be several quarters during our, our FY24. Uh, um, India has been very strong this year, of course, and, um, you know, I think we're expecting to see uh, more commitments to lay in both coverage and capacity in India during our, our FY24. Uh, so, look, we've got, uh, we've got leadership in many of these areas like optical control systems, 5G software-defined uh, solutions. Uh, it's really a question of timing in my mind, but... Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the communications market in totality, and particularly in wireless at this point. So hopefully that um, gives you the answer to your question. Well, I was asking about the overall business, Vince, not just about the comms, sorry. Okay. Yeah, well, look, at I think, Ambrish, um, 
the the overall business uh, you know we see some trends for example that will transcend the inventory digestion problem and even the macroeconomy areas like digital healthcare like uh, aerospace and defense the sustainable energy theme that we spoke to a little a little while ago so um, again i will just reiterate my sense is the inventory digestion problem will last probably two, three quarters, and then we'll get back into a unit volume increase from there on. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Ambrish. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stacy Rascon with Bernstein. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, Prashant, I don't want to be pedantic on uh, Q1, but I, I know you said, you know, right now, down seasonal, but also as an extra week. That extra week, if I just linearize it, is, is like a plus seven. So do those cancel out, or is it like it's the week between Christmas and New Year, so it's not a lot of revenue? Or just how do I think about the balance of those two things into Q1, assuming uh, a Q1 that was seasonal? Yeah, yeah. No, um, thanks, 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 Stacey. So, so um, when I gave you my comments of down seasonal, that was on a 13-week basis. The 14-week was just a reminder as you model it. So, Mike, if you want to do the math, but yeah. I think you're, you're essentially thinking about it right. Yeah, so, as Prashant said, let's take a first 13-week quarter. What happens normally in one queue in a 13-week quarter? Our business is down, call it 5% plus or minus, total business. Now, with an extra week, that adds about 7.5%, both on the revenue side and the OPEX side. So, there's two pieces. Normal, down 5%, total company. In the 14-week quarter, you can add 7.5% for revenue and OPEX. That's the best way to think about it. Yeah. And thank you for clarifying that, Stacey. That I, I wasn't yeah. clear in my answer. Okay, and then that would drop off into Q2, though. You go the other way in Q2. So Q2, and under like normal circumstances, would be worse than seasonal uh, because you'd have that extra week drop off. Yeah. So again, you can you can parse it. In normal times, two Qs up. Call it two to five percent in a 13 week to 13 week quarter. If you take away an extra week, yes, you have you have a seven and a half percent headwind. They, they've got one queue. Yeah. Got it. Okay, that, that's helpful. I have another one, but I, I guess I don't want to get that banned next next time. So I'll, I, I'll, I'll allow another question because that was a good clarifying question, <laughs> Stacey. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, OPEX into next year. So it sounds like you're guiding it to about $700 million, um, into Q4. Um, how do I think about it next year in, into a, a revenue year that's likely to be down potentially reasonably materially? Like, what, how, do we, how should we think about OPEX just year over year for fiscal 24 versus 23? Or the drivers? Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, Stacey, as we've always said, we, we run this business for the long term. So um, we're going to make the adjustments that are prudent to make on the discretionary side, uh, adjusting the variable comp and where, where we can, but uh, the, the value of this company comes from its innovation, so I wouldn't expect meaningfully more um, attack on the spending uh, into uh, 2024, but remember that our variable comp is designed to be highly accordion, so if 24 plays out as a down year, you will see that meaningfully unwind for us. Anything else? Like, is that 700 way? million runway? Like, is that like the right uh, run rate to think about? That's, that's, not, that's not a crazy level to think about for the year. I think if, if you take a step back and look at kind of what we're trying to manage, which are our control, we talked about gross margins maintained at 70% at trailing 12 month basis. So for the full year, I think we can do 70% gross margins, and our goal is to maintain our operating margins within our, our long term target. And the low end of that is kind of 42 to 45%. Um, so that's kind of some guardrails for you to think about as you're modeling out next year and what would be a down year for revenue. Got it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Stanley with City. Your line is open. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, and congrats, Prashant, on, on retirement. I wish I was uh, joining you. Hey, I just had a question on the auto end market. So you're saying that you expect it to do, I guess, better relatively than uh, industrial. Um, you know, given how much uh, inventory has been built there, uh, and the upcoming UAW strike, uh, do you think it's possible that auto could get materially worse? Are you baking that into uh, any kind of forecast? And then are your, you know, I guess auto supply chain customers talking about a potential strike and the impact on their inventory? 
Yeah, all right. So uh, thank, thank you for the question, Chris. I think uh, we're going to see you in a couple of weeks in New York. Um, so uh, on auto, get, get some, some context first. We've grown for 12 consecutive quarters year over year, and uh, including the fourth quarter, we're going to be up again. Uh, we said in the prepared comments that uh, the lead times and the confidence in supply is driving some of that acceleration and in inventory adjustments, and that's happening um, across all our markets. When we look specifically at auto in the quarter uh, and our growth rates there, you know, those same strong growers, BMS, GMSL, A to B, they grew in the third quarter uh, and year, both on a sequential basis and year over year, and we expect kind of a similar strength from them into the fourth quarter. So I think that, that our outlook is, as Vince said, is really end market units driven. And we have not yet put in a number, nor have we received indicators from our supply chain partners that we should be making adjustments based on any um, uh, disruption that could come from, uh, from the negotiations that are going on right now. Yeah, I think one other thing, Chris, to note is that in general, there's more and more silicon value in cars every year, and that's true of ADI. We've got the switch to the electrification, uh, which is, again, in pretty much the early stages of adoption. So there are some great uh, growth drivers that will somewhat transcend the, um, you know, the malaise, the economic malaise. But um, we still expect overall, as Prashant said, we've got many growth drivers that automotive will continue to be uh, the, uh, one of the banner growth areas for ADI for the foreseeable future. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Our next question comes from Harlan, sir, with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Harlan, you might be on mute. Hey, good. Good morning. Sorry about that. So in Q3, this fee was down, was about 62% of sales. It was down about 4.5% sequentially. So that's less than the total business. Shipments to your direct customers came down around 8 So maybe you guys can just discuss the shipment and excess inventory dynamics around both for Q3 and here in Q4. Is, is the excess inventory situation a little bit more pronounced at direct customers? And, and maybe similar to your DISTI customers where you have systems in place to monitor sell-through, like how do you – how do you monitor the levels of sell-through and inventories at your direct customers? Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, let's do, the, do a couple pieces on that. First, as a reminder, for, for a, a distribution company to do business with ADI, you have to give us your sell-through data on a weekly basis uh, in arrears uh, via uh, electronic data feed. So we know exactly where our distribution guys are doing business, and we use that to run the company, as Vince always says. We run it on a POS basis. We said in the third, uh, quor- sorry, in the second quarter earnings call, we said that uh, we had gotten a little ahead of ourselves in China and that we intended to undership China um, in the third quarter. We have done that. Uh, we are now intending to undership all markets um, generally in the fourth quarter to continue to bring the channel level inventories down. Um, we have limited direct data visibility into our end customers' inventory levels, except for those customers where we have consignment. But what we do have is, uh, which you don't have access to, is we can see the sales data of our products into our broad set of publicly traded external customers and their corresponding revenue growth. And our team builds correlation data based on that to tell us how we're doing versus how their growth is. And that's what Vince was referring to, that we have seen that, um, that their growth is accelerating versus our growth to them, which is why we have confidence that we are undershipping their end market demand, allowing them to pull inventory levels down, which, of course, it is safe to do so because now we can get our products to them within 13 weeks. Yeah, but I think that's a great point you made. Last, lead times is the best indicator of what our customers' inventory levels need to be. If a customer can get, even, get product quick, they need a whole lot less inventory. So our lead times improving is helping us give us better visibility into what the customers need to hold and what they're holding. Yeah, I think Prashant said earlier, 85% of our total portfolio now is available in less than 13 weeks. 
Big, big change yes. since hey, this time last year. Perfect. Thank you, Harlan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tashia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I had two quick ones, if I may. One on pricing. Um, Vince, you, you mentioned that in the near term, it's more of a unit correction as opposed to a, a correction in pricing, which, which makes sense. T to the extent uh, foundry pricing improves into 2024, uh, would you be in a position to, to share that sort of cost down, if you will, with, with customers the same way you've sort of passed on higher costs um, over the past couple of years? And then a second quick one for, for Prashant, uh, DOI of 179, I think that's up, you know, call it 50, 60 days vis-a-vis pre-pandemic. How should we think about the new normal going forward and how quickly can you get there? Thank you. Sure. Let, let me answer the, the pricing piece first this year. Um, there are really two parts of it. One is, you know, we have 75,000 product SKUs that are established and are, are the bedrock of the franchise of the ADI. Uh, they're very sticky. The product life cycles tend to be very, very strong, and they tend to be, once they're designed, and fairly price insensitive. And we're actually, in, we're also, by the way, increasing the value of our products each year. Um, you know, we're we're managing. The portfolio in terms of pricing, we're looking for elasticity, uh, which is just a normal part of portfolio management, but um, we're also adding more value to the products that we're introducing to customers, the new products. I think uh, the benefit of lower costs will come at the, uh, at the design in phase, if we, if we do get lower costs which from our third-party suppliers, which, by the way, I think is very, very unlikely. So I think um, the message is Pricing is stable and um, and very very you know the franchise is very durable. And I'll do the uh, the DOI one very quickly here, uh, Toshi. So um, 179 days balance sheet inventory grew, call it uh, low single digit sequentially uh, on a dollar basis. Um, we uh, we have high confidence that we will exit Q1 uh, taking out uh, at least 100 million dollars of inventory value and the production plans are being oriented to allow us to do that. The, uh, the days target, um, we have a model, uh, but uh, we've agreed that it is appropriate for the next CFO really to, to, to bless that model because they're going to own that and they need to, to, to kind of go through that math. So uh, I can tell you that it's not going to be at 180 days, but I don't think we get back to 120 days. So we'll... Uh, you know, we'll come back to you at some point on what that looks like. That's very helpful. Thank you both. Thanks, Toshi. Go to the last question, please. Thank you. Our last question comes from Joshua Bushalter with TD Cohen. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, and, Prashant, congratulations on the great run. Um, you, you mentioned a few times under shipping in the, in the print and the guidance. I, I was hoping you could maybe quantify the extent or maybe provide any sort of guidance to the amount that you're under shipping. And then, you know, given it sounds like a seasonal fiscal first quarter isn't off the table, does that mean, you know, we kind of expect you could be shipping to end demand exiting the October quarter? Thank you. I'll let Mike take the second part of that question because I'm not sure I fully comprehended it. But on the first one, um, so we have, we have our, our business that goes through the channel and the business that goes direct. Business through the channel, we have the demand forecast from our distribution guys, and we are under shipping into the channel to help them pull inventory levels in the channel down. We said that in the second quarter earnings call that we were going to do that for China. This quarter we're going to do it across, uh, across the, uh, the, the globe for all disties. Your second question on how to think about the under shipment into end demand that Vince referenced to, all I can really do is refer back to sort of the data analysis that, that we do. There's not, you know, there's not a real way to aggregate that except to say that we have a relatively good correlation between our end customers' revenue growth and our growth to those end customers on an individual basis. And when we look at how they grew in third quarter versus our shipments to them and how they're forecasting uh, or, cons or you guys are consensus forecasting their fourth quarter growth versus our shipments to them. To them, we know that uh, that we're going to be helping them.
to pull inventory levels down, which again makes tremendous sense because lead times have improved. And Mike, I didn't sure. Tell about on the first, it's a good question. If you look at the first quarter, we always typically undership consumption in the first quarter. Why? You see a lot of our customers reduce their working capital going into end of year end. So the down five percent in our in their seasonal first quarter is below consumption. I think after that, you get back to kind of what Vince was saying. You get kind of back to demand and consumption all kind of in balance, and then it comes to a question of macro, what's happening in macro in our second quarter. Thank you, Josh. Okay. Yeah, it's really helpful. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. We once again will be on the road a lot this quarter. You'll find us in New York, Chicago, Florida, London, and San Fran. Reach out to the IR team to be notified when we are in your zip code. And with that, thanks for joining us and interest in ADI. This concludes today's analog devices conference call. You may now disconnect.